So I, I'm always giving advice on that part. I did it over 30 years yeah. ago, but it's it's a tough. It's tough. Yeah, yeah. it is honestly. Well, yeah. You might as well stay up here. We're about ready to Just do stay? the intro. Okay. Wow, I feel like I'm at Catholic Church, right? Because there are people way in the back, and we have all these empty seats up here. So, um, good thing it's might so you can hear back there. But if you know there's not that many people here. You know, make the speaker feel a little more welcome. You might want to move up. All right. Okay. Um, our next speak speaker is Chris Gatto. He is uh, a researcher at Lewis and Clark College, and his interest cross computer science and economics, which is why he did this really interesting research project he's going to report out on. Yeah. Hi. So essentially, we are going to talk about the Tor browser today and an um, economic perspective, an economics perspective using game theory, how do we make Tor browser more secure in terms of like, you know, if someone wants to compromise the purpose of Tor browser, then how would they do it and what can we do against this? Now, bear with me if you don't know what Tor browser is or you don't know what game theory is and how, you know, the two merge together, I will give you a brief intro about uh, cybersecurity and game theory and how these can benefit from each other, essentially. Then I will talk about the Tor network. I, I will give you a non-technical description of, of how that looks like and a basic idea about how we can um, model this and how we can model the attacks that we are interested in and how we can model making it safer. And so I will show you some results ultimately and about what kind of numbers are we talking about, uh, how many times would an attacker succeed and how many times would they fail before and after our improvements um, as well, and you know, I, I will give you a snapshot of how we want to improve our models ultimately. <clears throat> so, how does cybersecurity come into play, and why is it interesting for me or for us uh, as a group of researchers? You know, uh, we are very interested in keeping anonymity uh, through cybersecurity. That that's our field. We want to make sure that uh, whatever you do, if you want to keep anonymous on the internet, you will be able to do so. And you know, some people want to uncover this anonymity and uh, identify you, you know, and this can interfere with your First Amendment rights in some ways, or it can also prevent you from getting certain websites in certain countries. I, I won't name names here or won't point fingers, but you know, not, you can't access any website in any country you go to. And so how does game theory uh, come into this? Well, we will talk about systems design or mechanism design here, and I will just say an example and a very simple mathematical description of the solution to that example that demonstrates how if you think about agents that want to maximize their utility from some perspective, how this can lead to an in a sub-efficient, sub-optimal outcome in some ways and, and how an improvement to a system that should be an improvement at zero cost can lead to an even more sub-optimal outcome in some ways. So let's think about two points, A and B, that are you know somewhat far from each other. And we can get to this uh, from point A to point B via path A, Z, B on the top and A, Y, B on the bottom. Now, how long does it take from get from A to B on these two paths? So let's define a function X and X is going to be the fraction of the people who take that road. So that's how much time of an hour it's going to take you to get from Y to B in terms of this path. So from A to Y, it's going to take you one hour, and from Y to B, it's going to take you the fraction of the people taking this road. So if, for example, um, nine-tenths of the people are taking this road, then it's going to take them 54 minutes. And if one-tenth of the people are taking this road, then it will take them six minutes. And on the top, from A, Z, B, we have the same function essentially just in the reverse order. So. How long will it take people on average if they keep repeating this path every day from A to B to get from A to B? So, you know, a person will take path A, Z, B on day one and they will realize that most people took this path, so it took them two hours to get there because everyone took this path. But then they will notice that A, Y, B would have taken them only an hour because no one took that path and, you know, from Y to B, it, they would have gotten them there really fast. So they will switch from a, Z, B, some people to A, Y, B, and this will keep balancing out until, until we reach equilibrium and it will take 90 minutes for both paths to, to get from A to B. This is like, you know, standing in a line in a shopping mall, essentially. Now, let's introduce an improvement to the system. So we can teleport from Z to Y 
at zero cost. So basically, you can just teleport there and continue your path. Um, what will, how much time will it take for people to get from A to B this way? So let's consider that you know people take the top path first. So the fraction of the people taking the top path, let's say that's one. And you can see that from Z to B, it's gonna take them one hour to get to point B, no matter what. So if they take that path, they have an incentive kind of to teleport down immediately because at, in the worst case scenario, it will take them one hour if everyone is taking the bottom path. But best case scenario or anything than worst case scenario, it will take them less than one hour. So they would take that teleportation machine sort of no matter what. On the bottom path, people can't teleport up, so it doesn't really matter. If they went bottom, they will keep going bottom from that point. So in having introduced this improvement into the system, it will take 120 minutes for every single agent to get from point A to point B. And this is pretty mind-blowing if you ask me because you, you just made an extra option that has no cost, yet it made the system as a whole more inefficient. So what's Tor? Uh, Tor is essentially much like Google Chrome in some ways, except you would use this if you want to keep anonymous. So if you don't want your ex-spouse or your government or whoever that is to know which websites you are visiting, who you are talking to on the internet, you would use a Tor browser. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's the purpose of it, essentially. Um, now, how does it work exactly? So if you, we start at the top left corner at your computer, so that's you, and then you will, using your internet service provider, you will connect to the Tor server. Now the Tor server has, an, has main, three main components, an entry, a middle, and an exit node. And each of these uses layered encryption, so each component can only see the previous and the subsequent connections you are making. So the entry node could only see you and the middle node, and the exit node could only see the middle node and your destination. But you know the exit node wouldn't, you, wouldn't know where the information is coming from. So because of this, you know, Tor is run with volunteers, and um, not everyone wants to be an exit node because let's say you are doing something illegal, the police would be knocking on your door if you are an exit node, if, if you know someone used Tor for um, non-legal purposes. So um, essentially, middle and entry nodes have no cost whatsoever. You can't really be caught, but exit nodes are somewhat dangerous to run in, in this regard. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, let's say you are using Tor from Alaska and you want to access a website in, um, say, Southern Europe. So Tor would keep routing you through different computers, proxies, if, if you know the technical term. Um, all around the globe, keep bouncing you until you know it connects you to your final destination and then backwards in a different path though. That's, that's important to highlight that the internet is asymmetric. So if you go from A to B on one path, then backwards is going, it's likely going to be a different um, path. So how can this thing be attacked? So this is the mathematical notation. Don't be scared by it if you are not familiar with math about uh, of a path we construct. So in the curly brackets, you see the two I's at the two ends. Uh, those are the internet service providers, essentially. For, pers for person N at time T, that's all PNT means, and NBT and NAT, all those uh, regard these internet service pro providers for person N at time T before and after the Tor network. And in the center, the three letter T's, those are the entry, middle, and exit nodes, essentially. So the type of attacks we are looking at are correlation attacks. This can be entry, exit, and end-to-end -end attacks. Uh, and um, the distinction between these and how these work is that an entry, exit attack would corrupt two Tor nodes in the Tor network. So the entry node and the exit node. An, a correlation attack can succeed if and only if the entry and exit nodes are um, corrupted. An end-to-end -end attack would be your internet service providers in some way doing an attack on you um, at the two ends of communication. So how are these carried out? Well, there are a, a variety of ways to do a correlation attack. Some of them could be watermarking. So the packages you send are somehow marked. And you know if you know that you mark the package at one end and it comes out at the other end, the package with your mark on it, you know it was you. And so you can relate the person who sent the package initially initially and the person who received the package 
And so you identified who is talking to who. And uh, alternatively, you could use timing. You could basically delay packets in certain fashions so that you can identify that it's you really uh, delaying uh, what's happening. So Tor itself admits that, you know, despite certain updates, they still are vulnerable to correlation attacks if you read the frequently asked questions section in their paper. So Tor's routing, how does that work? So first, uh, it's, it has a bandwidth threshold it assigns, which it uses to select the exit nodes we are looking at. An exit node can be any node that's entry eligible and exit eligible at the same time. And uh, if an exit, a selected exit node is below this bandwidth threshold, then it will keep selecting new, new potential exit nodes until one of them is uh, an exit node, essentially. Um, then it will select middle and entry nodes. Um, and you know, as I said, these can be exit eligible nodes as well. Then it will use any AS. So it does, Tor doesn't distinguish in between ASs it uses before the Tor network. Well, it can't, and, but it chooses any AS after the Tor network, which will be something we'll talk about later on. And it will keep you know, repeating this process until you, your communication ends. Um, so what would an attacker do in this scenario. So obviously they would make all of their nodes exit eligible because ex exit eligible nodes can be selected to be both entry and exit nodes. So they kind of double dip. Uh, it's very similar to selecting balls from a bag. Um, and that's what they would do. And also they would make their bandwidth as high as possible because higher bandwidth nodes have a higher probability of being selected. So how do we, or, or I am so sorry I gave that away. So how safe are you, the point over a year? Um, you, if you keep using Tor Browser for a year, based on our simulations, you would be safe only 60% of the time. With, you know, very, if you corrupted only a few nodes, basically, it would be pretty easy to uncover the identity of you if you use Tor over a year. So what can we do about this to lower the probability? So first, we would separate the selection pools of entry nodes and exit nodes. So if an entry node is selected, it couldn't be an exit node. So th these would be separate. And you know this works out based on the uh, properties of simple Bayesian statistics. You can verify it if you want to. Um, secondly, we would drop the bandwidth threshold. And this would not impact the speed of the Tor network severely in any way, because if you think about it, uh, any path has five components and the bandwidth threshold only applies to one of these. So if you drop it from this one, it's pretty unlikely that it would impact the speed overall since you know you are only as fast as your um, slowest component. Essentially, it's a bottleneck uh, we care about, not, not the speed of one single component. On the third way, you wouldn't want to choose the same autonomous system twice. So when you first communicate with the Tor network until the entry node, you cannot choose that autonomous system. Or I, internet service provider, apologies. Um, but after the exit node and between your destination, using data and control plane tools, you have some control over whether you want to route over Verizon, let's say, again, if you have once routed through them. And ultimately, I, we are aware that the internet is mostly asymmetric. Well, in fact, it is asymmetric, but still you can make Tor more symmetric and you should do that. So you, you should only drop uh, or deconstruct paths once it's absolutely necessary. You, you, you would want to keep reusing the same path over users and destinations for as long as possible because this kind of decreases the amount of tries attackers have to catch you and to de-anonymize you. So, what are our results? So, you know, you have these fancy functions here. And all we do on the x-axis, basically, is increase the resources attackers have. So those being how many exit nodes they control. And after separating, you know, the selection pools, we did some optimal, some optimization problem, very simple math. We calculated what would be the most ideal way to split in between entry nodes and exit nodes. And um, that's the blue line, your attack success probability as your resources increase essentially uh, for an attacker after you implement our improvements. So as you can see, it's like on the red line with very realistic numbers, it would be 15% essentially, somewhere around that, that uh, you are ident identified. And on the blue line, it would be 
about 5%, the chance that you are identified in a single try um, over the path. And, um, you know, what does this mean? This would mean that over a year's time, with how many times you Tor reconstructs paths and those numbers all taken into mind, as, we, as I said before, you stay, you stay secure 60% of the time before. And with our improvements, you would stay secure about 85% of the time. So, you know, that's a 25% gain, pretty significant, I would say. Um, and with very simple Im improvements. Now, it's important to emphasize that you as a, if some of you here are Tor node volunteers, running volunteers, then you have no control over this whatsoever. The only person or organization who, who could actually implement these changes is the Tor network itself. Um, so the summary, essentially, um, correlate, correlation attacks can hurt Tor users. Well, yeah, they can. I just demonstrated how. And uh, in the literature, it was thought after 2010, there was a huge update to Tor that because of the introduction of guard nodes, correlation attacks are not dangerous anymore or, you know, they are negligible. Well, they are not because, you know, Python improved. It became much more famous. Machine learning became much bigger. Uh, so they are, correlation attacks are indeed dangerous again. And, you know, game theory kind of is applicable to cybersecurity and it, it can be made to make Tor much more secure in, in terms of these attacks with very simple, with a very simple analysis. You can, you can go a long way and ultimately that's that. So I just would like to thank my collaborators, some of who are sitting here in the third, fourth, fifth row actually, and uh, I'm open to questions. Yeah. That's not entirely true. So you could use it, so on average, Tor will keep reusing the same, you know, guard nodes. So guard nodes are entry nodes, basically Tor keeps reusing for the same user for about 120 days. So for the first three to four months, 120 days, four months, uh, your probability wouldn't change. So if you weren't identified then, you got a friendly exit node, entry node, then you're good for that period until your exit entry node changes. Once your entry node changes, and you can check this, uh, then you are in danger again. So Let's say you were identified the first time, then you know you are already identified. It doesn't matter. But if you weren't identified the first time, you can just keep reusing it because you won't be afterwards either, unless your internal service providers, you know, change somehow. Um, yeah. Yes. So basically, there's nothing you can do to solve this problem. Yes. Tor has, has to implement it. Absolutely. But, you know, you can apply this principle to your life and think about what you do in such ways. Think the way an attacker would think. And no matter what kind of field you are in cybersecurity, interested in cybersecurity or actually no matter what, just think with the heads of the other person. Think about what resources they have and what they would do. Don't just assume that the introduction of a bandwidth threshold or a guard node would have a significant impact in the long run, which, which it does. But, you know, you could do better still. Uh, could you repeat that? Have you proposed fixes to the Tor Oh, not yet. We, we are still working on this research and we actually want to implement a uh, um, um, mechanism which isolates these malicious uh, packets. So we want to be looking at some, we want to send information to ourselves basically using Tor. And if we notice some anomalies, let's say, oh, the packet size changed or oh, there is a weird kind of, you know, timing discrepancy in how we receive these packets back. Then we want to isolate, you know, the nodes that were involved and then um, identify which one is malicious. So you want to develop a detection. Basically, yeah. So our research is not done. So you're also, you're also recommending use the same path as much as possible. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, so that... Yeah, so let's say we know that a user is identified. Well, you know, that's tough luck, but we don't want another user to be identified as well if in case that happens. Yeah. 
and you know modeling that takes time we are using monte carlo simulations and we want to improve upon them because you know there are tor simulators but the problem with them is there are way too many functions that do um crazy things that you don't actually know what kinds of distributions they use so that you can't really say if they are accurate or no when you are simulating such measures yes yeah it's a work in progress yeah our monte carlo simulations if you run it once it's pretty fast the only you know when we run it like 200 times to check our standard errors that's when it gets slow and tedious yeah Thank you.